Hi, my name's Brian. I'm the lead pastor here at Frontline. And I just want to thank you for joining our services online today. It's our hope that through these messages, the Word of God works powerfully in you and that you're built up in your faith and your relationship with Jesus. Well, what I want to do is I want to remind you that our vision here at Frontline is for every person to be plugged into a community of faith that preaches the Word of God. So our goal for these online messages is not that this would be a replacement for a community, but rather a supplement to your faith walk. So we strongly encourage everyone to enter into a physical community where they can be known and use their talents, join in worship, and work with others to proclaim the gospel. Our vision is that this would give you the opportunity to not miss a week where, for example, you're sick or maybe you happen to be gone traveling. So if you'd like more information on where or when we hold our services, then a great way to take a next step with that is you can find all that information at FrontlineGR.com. And one more time, I just want to thank you for joining us, and we really hope that God speaks to you powerfully in the message today. We have come here this morning to worship God. We have come here to lift up his name. We have come here this morning to give all the honor and all the praise to him. It's easy for us to worship other things. I think especially this time of year when summer comes along and it's easy to worship the beach or worship a vacation or worship some time away from what regularly happens. But that faithful God is here day in and day out and he is to be worshiped, he is to be praised. So I thank you for being here and worshiping him this morning. Not that you can't worship him at the beach, because boy, I've worshiped him at the beach this week, so, but uh, it is wonderful to be able to be together, to grow together as a community of believers and to lift up his name. So we worship him now in song, we worship him through the hearing of his word, And then right now, we're going to worship him through giving of our tithes and our offerings. So if I can ask the ushers to come forward, that would be great. Uh, I would love to pray for our offering, and then uh, we'll dive into the message this morning. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are worthy of all of our praise. And Lord, as we lift up your name this morning in song, Lord, I hope it put a smile on your face this morning. I pray, Lord, that you were pleased. Pray, Lord, uh, that you would... Uh, Give me the words to speak, Lord, that would touch lives, but also just penetrate hearts and cause something to happen today that typically doesn't happen in a lot of places is that it causes action for somebody to do something. So pray that that would happen. Pray that you would take these funds that we're about to give back right now, just a portion, a portion of what you have so generously given us. Pray, Lord, that you would use those incredibly in this community here at Frontline. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to move your name and move your power move your will through this community and draw more and more people to yourselves. And if we get to be part of that, that's awesome. Thank you for who you are. And we pray this in your name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning to you. Uh, My name is Blake. I have the privilege of being the executive pastor here at Frontline. I feel like I have to introduce myself because it's been a while since I have been here. Uh, My role has shifted in the last year uh, with the addition of another church to our collective. Uh, We have a collective of churches called the Zero Collective, which Frontline is part of, the Center Church down in Byron Center, and New Life Church. Uh, And the three churches together form a network of churches called the Zero Collective. Um, And our mission is until zero people remain unchanged by Jesus. Now that started here at Frontline and we realized we couldn't do that alone. So we have enlisted the help and started networking with a couple other churches and have brought them into the fold here. And so my role, my role shifted to the extent that I spend one week here at Frontline. Uh, Next week I'll be at... uh, 
New Life Church, and then the following week I'll be preaching over at uh, Center Church, and then I'll be back here at Frontline. So about every three weeks uh, you get to see me here, so if you don't know me, uh, at least hello to you this morning. Uh, a big shout out to our First Impressions team because uh, I walked in and we've got some new people and they had no idea I worked here. And so <laughs> it was awesome. I got treated with some royal, uh, royal treatment there, the VIP treatment, so, which was really cool, before they even knew I worked here. So uh, hopefully if you're new this morning, you got the same treatment uh, as I did. Um, but on this holiday weekend, I hope you've had some time to rest and relax and rejuvenate. Um, but that's not always the case for everybody. So I'm going to take you back to 1999, 20 years ago. Some of you probably weren't even born back then, but 1999. I was not a pastor at that time. I was uh, in business. I had some small businesses over on the west side of Grand Rapids that I owned and operated. And uh, I was in a, my Hallmark store. I owned a Hallmark store at the time. And one of my friends came pulling up to the store to go shopping that day. And her name was Carol. And uh, Carol pulled up to the store there. And she did one thing that I think a lot of us in this room, I'm going to say, probably have done at one time in our lives. And we've locked our keys in our car. That is such a helpless feeling. Now, granted, again, this is 1999. This isn't 2019. She didn't have an app on her phone where she could unlock her keys on her door. She didn't have OnStar. She didn't have any of that. She had to use the old-fashioned way, and that is use the telephone and call her husband to have him come down and help open up the car for her. So she asked to borrow my phone. She did that. Uh, she calls Len. Uh, Len is on the other side of town. That's her husband. And he's in a meeting. And now he has to travel to the other side of town, pick up the keys, and then come back and open up the door for her. So as any good husband would, he says, sure, honey, I'll be glad to do that. I think that's what he said anyway. And uh, so <laughs> he... Uh, he said, uh, I'll, I'll come and do that. She, on the other hand, she's in a Hallmark store. She got nothing to do, so shop. You know, I'm happy. She's happy. So she goes shopping. Well, Len makes incredible record time, runs to his house, picks up his keys, picks up the extra set of keys, runs back to the store there, sees her car in the lot and unlocks it, and then takes the keys and throws them on the floor mat for her. And so she, he comes into the store. He's looking for her. Say, hey, I unlocked your car. I put keys on the floor mat. But he can't find her. She's shopping. So he comes to me and he says, hey, Blake, can you tell Carol that I got her car open and I threw her keys on the floor mat? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. About 15 minutes passes by. Carol comes up to the register. She's got a few things in her hand to purchase. I'm happy. She's happy. We're all excited. And I say to her, hey, Carol, by the way, Len drove up and he unlocked your car for you and he threw the keys on the floor mat. And she got this, like, ghastly look on her face. And I go, what, what's wrong? And she's like, well, I, I went back out there to check on the car, and I found the passenger door unlocked. And I thought, Len is going to be so mad if I didn't check all the doors before. So I quick locked the doors and shut them. <laughs> I handed her the phone again, and I stepped away this time because I'm not quite sure I wanted to be hearing that conversation. But isn't that true? We're in such a hurry. We're in such a rush. Sometimes we cause problems for ourselves. Sometimes we cause uh, problems for other people. So I don't know if this is the case for you, but I'm living a very busy life right now. My wife and I are in, a, in a, just a crazy busy time in our life, and uh, I don't know where that's at. you're at in life right now, but I thought it would be kind of fun to find out maybe if you and two are as busy as Carol or as busy as me. So I came up with this little quiz here. So I'm going to ask uh, Eric to throw these up one at a time, and if uh, you say yes to any one of these, i got a feeling you're probably busy too. So the first one, are you always in a hurry. Are you rushing from thing to thing? Are you rushing back and forth? We rushed back last night from a family thing uh, up at uh, my parents' place and, you know, 11 o'clock at night running through a random storm that shows up out of nowhere and uh, it just uh, hurry home, hurry here, hurry, hurry, hurry. Is your to-do list always unrealistically long? Uh, for those uh, who know me, uh, they know that I walk around with one of these. Maybe you do too, but a little yellow legal pad is my life. If I don't write it down, it don't get done because I don't know if it's my age or what, but I have to write it down, and it always just seems to be really long. Preach message on here today. Okay, so do you feel guilty when you relax? 
Here's a big one. Do you feel like really guilty when you have a time to relax, like you actually should be doing something? Next one. Are you texting work stuff right now in church? <laughs> okay, I'm looking out there. So if you're texting work, you are too busy. Next one. Does your family refer to you as occupant? Are you so busy you're not even around? And last one. Do you multitask when you go into the bathroom? Okay, that is, you know, okay, you didn't have to raise your hands, you're in church, you did have to tell the truth, but uh, if that's you, I do not want to borrow your phone, okay, so we'll just leave that to yourself, but some of us are so busy. Uh, I was here preaching a couple years ago, and uh, I introduced you to uh, something called a savoring pace, a savoring pace. It was by a book by Kirk Jones, it was called Addicted to Hurry, it's talking about slowing down, uh, looking at things more clearly, and so if we can pull that up here, it says a savoring pace is living life that allows for seeing things more clearly, listening more carefully, and thinking more deeply. This statement, this way of life changed my life. It changed my life because when I started to see things more clearly, not rush through, but actually see things more clearly, and when I took the time to actually listen to people instead of thinking about what I wanted to say when they were talking to me, and when I took the time to think about things a little bit more deeply instead of just rushing into decisions like that, my life changed. My life changed. But the fact is not all of us live into this. and Not all of us live into a savoring pace. And we live at such a hectic schedule, we live at such a hectic time that we're not honoring God. So my question for you this morning is, are you honoring God with your rest? Are you honoring God with your rest? Uh, Exodus 31, 17 says, Six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. The question I ask is, why, why, why did God rest and why was he refreshed? I mean, he's, he's God, really. He really didn't need to rest, don't you think? I mean, obviously making the earth is quite, a, quite an arduous task, I would guess, but, you know, it would probably think, yeah, he would need rest and he would need to be refreshed, but he's God. He didn't need that. So why did he do that? He did that to model for us what it looked like to live a life that was less hectic. If you have your Bibles or if you have your phones, your iPads or something, we're going to spend some time in a familiar verse today. It is Psalm 23. It is called the Shepherd Psalm or it's called the Funeral Psalm if you're with me because every funeral that I officiate, I always read Psalm 23. Uh, and so it is a psalm that you probably have heard. Maybe you don't know which one it is, but uh, as we pull it up here, I think it'll come back to you. So Psalm 23 reads, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. This right here, this lies, makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me by quiet waters. This, my friends, this is rest and refreshment. Rest and refreshment. To lay down in a green pasture, doesn't that just sound restful? Don't you just want to lay down in a green pasture? Make it sure it's a clean pasture, but you want to lay down in a green... And refreshment, cool waters. I mean, hopefully you've spent some time on this holiday weekend next to some quiet, cool waters and been refreshed. That is what God wants for us. But do we ever slow down enough to enjoy it? Um, my question also is, has God ever, ever made you lie down? Has he ever made you lie down? It's not a lot of fun when the shepherd makes you lie down, but sometimes he does that for our own benefit. He sometimes does that when, when life is a little bit too crazy and he'll make us lie down. My mom, uh, who surprised me and was in the first service, which was so awesome to see her, but she, uh, she has a friend uh, was a number of years ago who had eye surgery and that eye surgery was so intricate that her friend was forced to lay on her stomach for three weeks without moving. Three weeks on your stomach, only to get up to go to the bathroom or go to eat, but those were the three weeks there. And the first few days, I mean, you can imagine how, scru <laughs> how excruciating that was to just sit there and like you're looking at a tile of a, like a four by or three by two or something like this wide. That's your vision. And so she'd watch TV that way, she would read books that way, but God got her attention during that time. 
And you would think that would be a bad time, but you would talk to her. That was a spiritual refreshment time when God got her attention. Now, I'm going to show you something up here right now. Um, here's, a, here's a quick quote. To give God my best requires rest. To give God my best requires rest. We've got to have rest to give God our best. So I'm going to show you right now. This is my well-being triangle. Now, this is not uh, anything that you're going to find like online. This is not proven fact. This is Blake, okay? This is not anybody else here. But this is my triangle of my well-being. And my triangle used to be uh, like a regular triangle. I used to have the spiritual on top and the physical on the side and the emotional on the other side. And I figured if my triangle was in balance, my life was in balance. It makes sense, doesn't it? If your spiritual is in balance and your physical is in balance and your emotional is in balance, you should probably live a pretty balanced life. But what I realized was my triangle was wrong. And so I inverted my triangle and put the spiritual on the bottom, the emotional in the middle, and the physical on top. And the reason why I did this is everything hinges on my spiritual well-being. If my spiritual well-being is off, my triangle shifts. And it doesn't matter if I can bench 250 and run an eight-minute mile, which I can't do, by the way. But if I could, if my physical was awesome like that, but my spiritual was gone, I mean, it wouldn't matter at the end of my life. Or if my emotional was awesome, like I had all these great relationships and things were really flowing well with all of my communication with people, but yet they weren't based on God's facts or God's truth. They really would mean nothing. So this is my, my well-being triangle. And I'm going to just be totally honest with you, not that I haven't been already, but just totally full open to you right now. My triangle has been off for the last few weeks, okay? Probably the last month, to tell you the truth. And it was called out on, it, on me by, uh, actually, our senior pastor, Brian. Uh, he was concerned about me. And so he says, hey, how are you doing uh, spiritually? And so I just had to look at him, and I'm like, I'm not doing good right now, and just being honest with him. And uh, he says, well, we got to take care of that. <laughs> and so we, uh, so we sat down. He prayed for me. We started taking some actions of what it would look like to be in a better spiritual spot. So I tell you that uh, just to give you a glimpse of what's happening in my life, why my triangle was off. And so uh, here's just a little glimpse into our lives, my wife and I's lives right now. We have four kids. Uh, our oldest daughter, Shelby, she's married. She has to our two grandkids, which are awesome, by the way. I highly recommend it, is have those first, but you can't. But uh, they're great. I love my grandkids. But um, so she has, two, she has our two grandkids, and she's expecting her third child uh, next month. So she is uh, due in August, and uh, we take care of the grandkids about uh, two days a week. It seems like more sometimes, but uh, while well, she can go to work and do stuff. And it's just, it's fun, but it's busy. Uh, our other three kids decided to pull a fast one on all of us and decided that they were all going to get married this summer. So we have three weddings this summer. So if you know how busy it is to plan one wedding, try two and three, okay? So we are running wild with wedding stuff and plans, and we had one down already. We've got two more to go, but we're working through that. My wife and I looked at our house and said, you know what, our house seems just a little bit too big now. All the kids are gone. Uh, so what does it look like to sell our home? So we put our home on the market a couple weeks ago, and, or I'm sorry, about a month ago now. And, uh, and for the last month, we've been vacuuming ourselves out of our house because we have to show it every, you know, at a, at a moment's notice. So trying to keep that place clean. But... Uh, we ended up selling our home uh, last week, Sunday, so now we're in the process of packing up 20 years of stuff and, uh, <laughs> and try to figure out what we're going to do with that. So where are we going to go? We decided we're at a time in our lives we thought, you know, it would be really fun to build a home because, you know, we don't got a lot going on right now. We could probably build a house because there's not many decisions that go along with that, is there, you know? <laughs> so... You know how many colors of grout there are, by the way? I just could tell you, like, yeah, there's a, there is a lot of colors of grout. So we decided to, uh, to build a home. Well, our home's not going to be done. Well, we have to get out of our other one. So we got to move out of this one, and we don't have any place to go. So we ended up going back with my wife's parents. And so we're going to be living in the basement, you know. That's everything you want to do when you're 53 years old. Go live in your parents' basement, you know. But we're going to go do that for uh, a couple months. Uh, what else do I got going? Oh, um, 
Before I, I came into ministry, as I said, I owned and operated some business. I sold all of those except one. I, I own a summer business, an ice cream store that is on the other side of town that I just really enjoy doing. It's kind of a hobby of mine, but uh, I have 14 employees under the age of 21, and they're all female. And so we got a little drama going on right there, so it's, it's okay. Not that it wouldn't happen with guys, but there's a little drama going on right there. And... Uh, and so that's going on. So you, as you can imagine, life is a little hectic right now for us. And so why do I tell you all these things? I certainly don't want your pity or sympathy. I could use a little help with the weddings if you want to get my GoFundMe account. Oh, no, I'm <laughs> We're not going to hit that. Um, I tell you all these things because this message right now is, is for me. And, and you just happen to be here, which is awesome. I'm thankful for that. But this rest and refreshment is what I have to lean into myself. And I know that I'm busy. And I talk to you guys, and I know you're busy, because when the first thing I ask you is like, hey, how are you doing? And instead of saying, I'm doing well, or things are going great, it says, I'm busy. I'm busy. Life is busy for us. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at this Psalm 23, because I th- pulled some nuggets out of this psalm, thinking that how can we lean into this rest? How can we lean into this refreshment? How can we lean into what God has called us to do? So again, how are we honoring God with our rest? So here's the first thing I think we can do, is rely on the shepherd. Rely on the shepherd. Go, go back to our verse there. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. Uh, just focus on this first part right here. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I want to ask you right now, is the Lord your shepherd? Is the Lord your God? Uh, a shepherd is one who cares for his sheep, one who cares and loves his sheep, but a lot of times the sheep don't really care for the shepherd. (laughs) I'm wondering, do we love our shepherd? Are you spending time with your shepherd? Because if the Lord is your shepherd, you lack nothing. But if the Lord's not your shepherd, I think we're going to lack a few things. And my question is, is the Lord your shepherd? A lot of us have trouble with our value in life, and we, uh, we attribute our value to things we own, things we do, people we know, stuff in our life is what we tr- uh, attribute our value to. And the reason we attribute our value to those things is because we're constantly running to strive to get to those things. This was the case for me for many, many years. It's one of the reasons why I'm standing in front of you today is I kept striving. I kept striving to be better and be better. Um, I was in a family business, and my dad had started that. And, uh, man, I got my value in what I did. I got my value in my work. And I wanted to be as good as my dad. I wanted to be thought of in the same way that people thought of him that they thought of me. And that caused me to run and to run and to run. And I'll tell you what, at a point, it just got too much. And it's not that I quit. It's more of I realized my value is not in what I do. It's not in what I attain. But my value is in God. My value is in my shepherd. I, I wrote this down because uh, I, I, just, I wrote this down years ago. And it says, I don't have to prove anything. I'm already extremely valuable. God created me. Jesus died for me. The Spirit lives in me. I am unique. I don't have to prove anything. When we prove and we strive and we run after that things, we run ourselves ragged. And what we're doing is we're not relying on the shepherd. We're relying on our own, on our own value. We're relying on ourselves to make it to the, to the pinnacle. But we can't do that. Our value, our value is not what gives me worth, but whom I belong to. It's not what I do that gives me worth, but whom I belong to. Our value is in not what we do. Our value is in whom I belong to. Do you belong to the shepherd? Because if you belong to the shepherd, 
you lack nothing. You lack nothing. Here's another thought right here. Enjoy what we already have. Enjoy what we have. If we're going to find rest and refreshment within God, we've got to enjoy what we already have. Many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, are not content people. We are discontent, if you would. We, uh, we're constantly chasing after the next best thing. We've got to have what the Joneses have, what the Smiths have, what we see on TV, what the world is telling us that will make us happy. <clears throat> and what it does is it causes us to work and to work and to work so we can achieve that. But if we really want to tr uh, truly achieve rest and, re rest and refreshment, we're going to be content with what we have. Uh, Philippians here says, uh, Philippians, oh, there we go. Philippians 4, verse 12, 13 says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I'm, whether I'm well fed or I'm hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or I'm living in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This right here, it says, I have learned the secret. Do you know contentment can be learned? Contentment can be learned. It, it seems like a foreign thing to us. It feels like you should be born content. Or she was always content. You hear that sermon, like, or that saying, like, she was content, or he's always content, like that. But I think there's a sense of us that we could actually learn how to be content. Um, this happened just this past week. My dad uh, lives up on a lake. My dad and mom live up on a lake up in Nuago. And uh, my dad had wanted to get a new pontoon boat for so long. He's had the same pontoon boat for like 30 years. Okay, so it was worn, it was tired, it was old, it was time to be put it out to pasture. So he wanted to get a new pontoon boat. Got uh, decided on which one he wanted, everything was all set. And he went to talk to the neighbor, and the neighbor said to him, and said, hey, uh, what kind of motor you got on that thing? And my dad's like, oh, 25 horsepower, like that. And my neighbor said, the neighbor said to him, says, well, you know what, if I was you, I'd probably get a 50 on there thing. You can go, go a little faster on, uh, with a 50. So my dad thought about it for a little bit. Well, okay, maybe I should get a 50 or so. Well, he talked to the other neighbor and says, hey, what, what kind of motor are you going to get on that pontoon boat? And uh, the neighbor, uh, my dad says, well, I was talking to Bill, and he said maybe a 50. And the other neighbor says, if I was you, I'd get a 75. You mean, you could get a 75 horsepower, and you can just get right across the lake like that. My dad's like, well, maybe I should get a 75 horsepower on that thing. Talks to another neighbor and says, hey, what's, what, what kind of motor are you going to get on that thing? And, the, and my dad says, well, I was talking to him. I'm you know, 75, I think, is what I'm going to go. Neighbor's like, you know what? You, what you need on that gourd? You need 125 horsepower motor on that thing like that. You can pull the grandkids skiing. You can pull them to it. All that fun stuff. <laughs> Have you ever seen anybody pulling a skier with a pontoon boat? It's a silly looking thing. But <laughs> isn't the definition of a pontoon boat to like, Putts? I mean, really? That's what we do? It's like, we've, we've never gone fast on our old pontoon boat. Why do we need this big motor on there? Here's the secret. My, my dad, at 81 years old, is, is still struggling with, with what, how to be content, you know? And not that we don't with all the different things in our life, but he's still struggling with that. I think we can learn to be content. We can learn to be content. Last thought here. Last thought. We have the first one is rely on the shepherd. Second one is enjoy what we have. And third one is succumb to a Sabbath. Succumb to a Sabbath. Now, you're, uh, you're sitting here on a Sunday, which is awesome, by the way. Thank you for being here. Uh, and this is Sabbath for many of us. Many of, it's not my Sabbath. I'm working today. I only work one day a week. But I do where it's a... <laughs> no, it is, uh, it is not my Sabbath. Friday is my Sabbath here. And, uh, and the reason Friday is my Sabbath is because, obviously, as pastors, we work on Sunday, and we work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we take Fridays off, typically as a group, to be our Sabbath, and then Saturday is our day off. Saturday is our day off. But uh, Exodus 20, 19, 20, verse 9 says this. He says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male, nor your female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your, arm, in your uh, towns here. Uh, 
this isn't a suggestion by God, okay? This is an exodus. This is where all the Ten Commandments come up, okay? So this is number four, right in there with do not murder, do not commit adultery. He's saying to take a Sabbath. And the Lord's pretty stringent upon this because he knows, he knows that we need it. In fact, you may not know this or not, but you are hardwired to take a Sabbath. It has been medically proven that your heart beats differently every seventh day. And the reason it does that is because you are in need of Sabbath. You are in need of a Sabbath. Now, we get kind of hung up with different Sabbaths, okay? What you can do and what you can't do on a Sabbath. When I was growing up, Sabbath looked a little bit different than it does today. I couldn't ride my bike on Sundays growing up. And the reason my parents gave me that I couldn't ride my bike was six days you could ride your bike. The seventh day, it wanted to look different. It wanted to look different. And so my parents said, let's do this and we're not going to have you ride your bike. I can remember, and maybe some of you in here can remember, when Meyer opened up on Sundays in Grand Rapids. I mean, it was like a big deal. Like, okay, all of a sudden, they broke up the Sabbath. Everybody's like, oh, no, you know. So relax here. I'm not here saying you can't ride your bike on Sundays. I'm not here saying you can't go shopping at, at, uh, at Meyer on a Sunday. But what we can do is set the day aside to look a little different. Because the Sabbath... The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay? Look at that. The Sabbath was made for man, the man not for the Sabbath. And so what, um, what God's saying there is the fact that I created this day for you to rest. I created this day for you to take a side apart and to honor me with it. So what does a Sabbath look like? What does a Sabbath? I think there's three things that a Sabbath looks like here. First thing on a Sabbath is rest your body. Rest your body. Second thing is recharge your emotions. And the last thing is to refocus your spirit. So we take a look at those things and says, well, how do we rest our body? Uh, for many of us, we're going hard all the time. And we're, we're running, we're running, and running. So what does it t- look like for us to just take a day and say, you know what? My body is just going to be my temple today. And I'm just going to slow down. And I'm just going to take it easy today. I like to run. I like to bike. I like to swim. And I'll tell you, I, I love to do all those things. But on my Friday, I take it easy on that day. Recharging uh, your emotions. Um, what does it look like to recharge your emotions? Maybe you get your emotions recharged uh, at the beach. Maybe you get your emotions recharged uh, reading a book or spending some quiet time in prayer. But what does it look like to recharge your emotions once every seven days? And last there is refocus your spirit. That's what we're doing today corporately as a, as a family here together. But it doesn't always have to be together. You can refocus your spirit individually. You can refocus your spirit within a small group. You can focus your spirit with just your spouse or your girlfriend, um, somebody close to you, and just start talking about those things that really matter in life <clears throat> and how you're going to live into them. And so... Uh, What happens a lot, though, is when we start taking a look at these things and we're saying, Blake, you're actually telling me to slow down. You're telling me to take a Sabbath. We're thinking we're going to give something up, right? We think that, you know, just because I'm going to do this, you know, I have to give something up. But let's, let's go back to our verse there real quick here. The Lord is my shepherd. What does it say? I lack nothing. He's going to give it back to you. He's going to give it back to you. You honor him with a Sabbath. You honor him with the resting of your body and your emotions, and you refocus your spirit like that. He is going to tenfold that back to you, and you're going to realize, man, I should have done this forever ago. One of the great things that uh, I get to do within my role is I get to meet with our team leads here at Frontline and at the Center Church and at New Life. And I get to spend time with them uh, once every other week. Uh, it's a regular meeting on my calendar. And I get to just hear about what's going on in their ministry. So uh, we go over what's called a ministry action plan, uh, what plan they're putting together to take new ground or how we're going to move the ball forward down the court, um, how they're going to you know, take this initiative and, and do that. So I help them along with that lines. 
We talk about metrics, okay, specific numbers we want to hit. Uh, we got Spring Hill Camp coming here next week, uh, or actually tomorrow. And, uh, you know, Amanda, our children's pastor, and I sat down. We made a goal and said, hey, what does it look like to have 100 kids here? And she just blew it out of the water. We've got like 120, 125. Oh, my goodness. Holy cow. So just blown. Yeah, I'm going to clap on that. So we talk about that, some metrics like that. And uh, same, I meet with all of these team leads like that. But really, the best part of my job uh, of meeting with them is focusing on their triangles, focusing on their emotional and their spiritual and their physical well-being. Because it's much more important to me that they're leading from a well-conditioned soul than it is the job they're doing here. And that may sound weird coming from the executive pastor, but I'm more concerned with the person than I am the position. I'm more concerned with the person than I am the position. Because here's what I know. Here's what I know. If they're operating from a well-conditioned soul, if their spirit is being well-contained and they're physically and emotionally healthy, the job will take care of itself. The job will take care of itself. Here's a fact that you may not know, but I definitely know, uh, is between 500 and 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month. Every month. That's a lot of folks. I don't want our team to be a statistic. So I'm more concerned about them than I am the job they do. The job will take care of itself. So when I sit down with Corey, and I talk to him. I talk about all the stuff that he needs to do here, worship stuff, but I'm concerned about his wife, Sarah, who's due with her third child, and their two kids, and the fact that Corey just got a new bike, and he just loves riding bikes with his family now. I'm concerned with Amanda, as I just mentioned again, our children's pastor, Eric, who happens to be doing our slides here. The, their son, Christian, just had surgery a couple weeks back, and so I'm really concerned about how that is. I have the opportunity to pray with Amanda before that happened. Um, Jesse, our missional pastor, him and his wife, Loretta, and their three kids, and their vacation this weekend, so how cool that is. And then David and uh, his wife, Shannon, and they have little Judah, and then they're fostering a little baby right now, so their life is just crazy busy. And we've got Chris, who is, who is my admin assistant, who is just moving this week, so she's moving into a new place. So I'm, I'm crazy concerned about all of that stuff because the person is much, much more important than the position. One of the great things that I've been able to help initiate here is something that's called a dog day. A dog day. A dog day is a day away with God. A dog day is a day away with God. So I presented this to our leadership team a number of years ago, and I said, what would it look like if we could find a day of spiritual refreshment for our team once or twice a year, what would it look like if we could do that? And our leadership team, and they just love on our, on our staff, and they says, you know what, Blake, that's awesome, but we're not going to just do, do one or two. We're going to do four. We're going to do one every quarter. One every quarter. And here's what a dog day is. Here's what a dog day is. Can you throw that up? The Zero Collective strives to create um, <clears throat> and maintain a healthy team, including encouragement, and support in areas of spiritual, physical, and family health. One way that the Zero Collective helps maintain spiritual well-being is by offering dog days. Dog days are an intentional time away during the work week to focus on your relationship with God. There is not a set design or a plan for a dog day, but rather an individual decision on how to make it most impactful and beneficial for the employee. That's right from our human resource manual, and I can't believe I put that up on a screen in front of the whole tab here, but I just want you to know how important this is. Because here's, here's something, that when my team, when our team here takes a dog day and they come back, they're different. They're different. They're refreshed. They're, they've got more vigor for their job. They seem to be more focused, and it just lifts them up. So my question for you here today is, do you need to schedule a dog day? Do you need to take a day away with God? I don't know what that looks like in your schedule. Do you need to create some extra time in your next few weeks where you can say, you know what, I'm going to either take a vacation day or I've got some other sick day or something. I don't know, however you're doing your work. 
but to take an intentional day away and spend it with God and refocus and get refreshed. Because let me tell you, it's going to be totally, totally different for you if you do that. So I think there's a couple different groups of people in this room this morning. There's first group of people in there going like, Blake, that seemed like a great message today. Sort of okay message. Anyway, but uh, it was, it didn't really, you know, I'm already doing this. I've already rely on the shepherd. I already enjoy what I have. Man, I love my Sabbath day. And you're sitting here going like, wow, you know, that's, that's, that's cool. I, I get that. And I'm living into that. And can I just say, way to go. Way to go. But there's other people like me, and I'm in that second group, who aren't doing that. Who need, who need people like you to help us get refocused. To help us lean into us. Maybe you're a small group leader and you can look at your team and you can say, you know, hey, there's somebody on my team in my small group that could use some refreshment. Maybe there's a single mom in this church here right now who could use some rest and refreshment from her kids and you can step into that. Maybe there's somebody down the street, and man, their kids are just running wild. And you're like, man, I wish they'd just be under control. Why don't you just step in and say, you know what? How about if I provide for you guys a date night? And I'll watch your kids for you. Maybe that's what group you need to be in. For those of us on the other side, man, we would welcome your voice in our lives. We would welcome your voice in our lives. The three things today we... Rely on the shepherd, enjoy what you already have, succumb to a Sabbath. If you put those together, you get rest. It's the southern, it's rest, okay? It's not rest, it's like rest, okay? Adding a T would have just been a lot of work, okay? So uh, you put a, if, you, if you're anal, you just put a T like a cross or something on there, you'll be all set. But uh, what does it look like to live into this, to rely on the shepherd? Enjoy what you have and succumb to a Sabbath. I think it'll change your life. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Let's pray. Father, you are so good. You are so loving. And you only want the best for us. Your word, it comes alive when we take time to spend in it. Your word has instructions for how we're to live. And we run by it so quickly sometimes. And we look at a familiar passage like this and just glimpse and don't take note of it. But Father, you are the good shepherd. You take care of your sheep. Help us, Lord. Help us to be better. Help us to honor you with our rest. I pray, Lord, that through all of it, you would receive honor and that you would receive glory. For that is why we are created. Just as I said this morning, we are created to worship. And how we do that is through our rest and through many other ways. But I ask, Lord, that you, above all, would be honored. And I pray this in your name. And all God's people said,